Hello, this is Debbie Q, and you're listening to The Right Shoe. The Right Shoe is a podcast that's about the strange and unusual. Um, you can reach me, the right shoe at yahoo.com, to email me for any suggestions. On Twitter, it's either The Right Shoe or I've used Bookshotworm1 for so long. You know, go on either one for my Twitter, and I am on Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes. The more that this is listened to, the more podcasts that I produce, the more that you'll be able to find it. And I I will put on the best show that I can. Today's podcast is going to be The Tragic Death of Tina Severns. Tina was a friend of mine. She was actually my, um, the twin sister was my sister's best friend. I'm going to just jump right in. Uh, What happened, the year, I will take you back, was 1986. And it was one of the best years of my life. I love 1986 because that was when everything was good. Everything was different than it is now. To me, I mean, don't get me wrong, I life is good and all that, but life was different back then. Back then, my gosh, it's, you know, I, I have two kids and I, I often tell them stuff about when I was young and they, they laugh at me and they think I'm just such the dork, you know. But I try to tell them, like, my life was when there was no cell phones, there was no this mass media there was no um like you could do whatever you wanted you know you could get crazy on a friday night and do some stupid stuff and it wouldn't come back to haunt you i mean i see these dreadful shows about these poor girls who make one little mistake you know like they show their boobs or they're with some guy and and then it's all over the place and they're devastated and some of them actually kill themselves over it it blows my mind so you know that the point is is that back then we we didn't have any of that it wasn't um it was different it was simpler times it it wasn't i'm not just saying that it you know it's not in my head like it genuinely was a lot of fun and um so that it leads into this because what happened when this situation happened with Tina, I'm telling you, our neighborhood was just crushed. Not only for the death of a 13-year-old girl who was a beautiful person, mind, body, and spirit, but it destroyed that family. They, they rebuilt themselves the best that they could. But in the beginning, it, you know, the older I get, uh, when I think back, I think, how did the mother you know, who was my mom's best friend at the time, and, you know, my mom was going through a divorce, and and Tony was dealing with Tina, and I don't know how she got through it. it it's got to be just awful, um, but I didn't really, at the time, you know, when you're young, you don't, you know, you know it's sad, and you know that it's horrible, but you don't truly realize what a tragedy is in, until you get older. It really does hit you differently. And she was such a, a sweet girl. I, I didn't know her as well as I knew her twin sister. Um, how we met was I was going out with a guy and we would always sit in my basement. My basement was like the hangout place of Comorel Park in northeast philadelphia it was a we would sit down there and you know and i'll be honest we would smoke our pot and and drink and that's just the way it was and that's what you did and it wasn't a big thing and it wasn't a horror story it was just it was what it was and parents were a little more lenient or maybe they just were a little more naive and I don't know, they just never bothered us. You could sit down there and do whatever you wanted, and nobody ever came down. 
you know, like we would, so that's where we were the day that I had met Tina. Uh, we were downstairs and her twin was, and another guy, Mike, he was waiting for my friend, Peggy. They were going out and I know these names are, they're just the names of my friends at the time. And, and I remember Mike was strumming on a guitar and then I remember Trisha was strumming on the guitar. And it was just out now hilarious. When I had met them, now they were identical twins. So when they came into the basement, I was just all into my boyfriend. So the only thing I remember about, I just remember them walking through and they were going into the backyard. So they came down the stairs, went through the basement, went out into the backyard. I, I don't even think I said two words to her. I just knew that there was the twins. They were popular. Twins are usually popular because it's a neat thing, you know, especially identical twins. And they're beautiful. You know, I, that was my sole introduction to Tina. Trisha, however, later became, you know, very close. In fact, I was with her last summer when my own father passed away. And last year when I had went, I went over to see the mom and and just say hi and and you know there's not like shrines of tina but there's pictures obviously i mean she was their sister so when i see them now though i think my god it was it felt like a million years ago 1986 to me feels like a million years ago like did it ever really happen it was just such a free-spirited time and that's what i'm trying to get across because everything changed after this, we never had anything like this happen in my neighborhood. Nothing. I mean, we would go places, say, tell our parents where we were going, and then we would stay there and have fun. And maybe we would call our moms, maybe we wouldn't, maybe they would call us. But we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have, you know, beepers or anything like that. We barely just had gotten answering machines. So we would call, you know, they might call us and say, How you doing? And that was that. I mean, that's the way it was. Because when you tell the story, in today's world, it just seems so bizarre. Because there's so many things that could have been done. And, and do I think it would happen in today's world? I don't think so. And there's a few reasons. So I guess I should start with the night of the incident. I was 16. I was slightly older. And, you know, then my sister, she was 13 and Tina was 13. Her twin, of course, was 13. And which I just can't believe, my God, they were babies. The night of the incident, she was sleeping. Now, I'm only going to use names that were used in the paper. I am not going to use anybody's name that was not in the paper for privacy sake. Especially the girl that was with Tina that night because she got a lot of flack afterward which uh, totally was not warranted it was just people were so angry that they were trying to blame everything and everybody in this involved in the situation uh what happened was tina was with a friend and two guys and they were in a car and they were partying and drinking and driving around and that's also what we did back then we would get into a car and we would just drive around I did it all the time. Everybody did it. We didn't wear seatbelts. That's the way it was. You know, I remember Tina's mom saying in one of the articles, there's very few articles about Tina Severance in, in the papers. You, you can find a few, but not many. Most of it goes by memory because I remember it vividly. In retrospect, they had said there was a guy that had been going around pretending he was a cop. Now, I remember Tina's mom said in the paper, like, she's not whitewashing that her daughter was where she shouldn't have been. But she also thinks that maybe if they had said, like, look, there's a guy running around saying he's a cop, but he's not, maybe this incident wouldn't have happened. In today's world, kids are so savvy. And you have instant cell phones where you could call and check immediately or just say, look, you know, you're a cop. Let's go to the station. You know, kids are just, 
they're just more savvy today than we were. We were a lot more naive because nothing like this had ever happened. So they were driving around drinking and this guy pulled them over and he told the girls to get out of the car. So right away, yes, it seems very strange, but we did what we were told when an adult told us to do something. That's the way it was. You listen to your parents. Um, there was still, you know, we got spanked. I mean, that that's, you know, and we were, we feared our parents and we feared adults and we listened to adults. And, and when he said he was a cop and to get out of the car, Tina followed what was instructed. Um, again, nowadays it's a whole different platform. So he, Tina and her friend got into his car and what always breaks my heart is that Tina, back then there was what was called bench seats in the front. It, there was no, like, I don't even think they make them anymore. It's, you know, there's, what do you call bucket seats in the front? There's only two seats in the front seat of a car nowadays. Back then there was a bench, so three people could sit in the front. Again, no seatbelts. They, she was in the middle. The friend was on the passenger side and Albert Altamari was in the driver's seat. This man who claimed to be an officer and they were driving and he said he was going to take them home. Now, before I get to what happened next, Albert Altamari's backstory was not good. Uh, they still don't know if he was the guy. They had found, in retrospect, three different guys claiming to be cops in that area, getting girls out of cars and raping them. Uh, that the, We were never alerted to this. And they don't even know if Albert Altamari was the one who did this. They He might have copied off of somebody. They only know that it was being done. So however he got this idea, we don't know. Also, his wife had just divorced him or perhaps maybe, I don't know if they were divorced, but I know that they were separated. She had went to the Philadelphia courts. They had come from Wisconsin where he had did eight years. Well, he was supposed to do eight years for raping somebody. He did five of those eight years. And he was released. So they came to Philly. The mom, the, the wife, they had girls together. And she claimed that he was molesting the children. So he, she was granted a restraining order. And she said in court, he's going to kill somebody. But he didn't kill anybody yet. It was the typical thing that you see on like Mindhunter and all that where he was elevating in steps. He started raping, and, and then Tina was his first kill. Who knows? He could have killed other people. We will never know that. But he was definitely escalating. So there you go. I mean, right off the bat, it, it, he was a known offender. And here he is driving around, pulling over girls, and he got Tina in the car. She, when he pulled up to the friend's house, he, that she was supposed to sleep over that night, he instructed, for some reason he chose Tina, he instructed Tina, the, the girl to get out of the car, Tina got out of the car to let her friend out. I, I guess Tina must have been sitting on the right side and the girl was in the middle. Tina had gotten out of the car to let the other girl out and that always makes me crazy because god i think tina you could have ran into the house and said you know why ah, whatever this guy's out there but they thought he was a cop and they wanted to keep him on the hush hush so she just got out of the car and went into the house the the friend and tina got back in the car with albert altamari not knowing what was about to happen and then the next day when Tony her mother called the friend to say send Tina home which was what we all did you know the mom would call and say send my child home and to her horror they said 
what do you mean? Didn't the cop bring her home? So I, I can't imagine her heart must have went right through her stomach because then uh, right away she realized something was dreadfully wrong. Uh, there was no cop that brought her home and she didn't even know what they were talking about. And then when the girl realized that Tina didn't get home, oh gosh, all I know is that my mom woke me up that morning. It was my first day of junior. Well, it was my first day of being a junior in high school. And I went to a Catholic school, wore a uniform, and I remember being, I can remember being on my bed. And the way I was laying, I can remember everything so vividly. And my mom said, Debbie, do, do you know where Tina is? And I was like, what, what do you mean? And she said, you know, Tina's missing. And, and I laughed. I mean, my first instinct was to chuckle. And I said, no, she, she's out partying because that's what we always were doing. And we, I assumed she would be home after she got, like, maybe she was sleeping a load off. And then the, the, the story came out and I just, we were floored. I mean, as a, as a, a neighborhood which again, it was called Morrell Park. We were just horrified. Nothing like that had ever happened in our neighborhood. I mean, we would go out three, four in the morning, sleep over each other's houses, stand on corners like and play around, like point to the sky as cars drove by so that people would look up at the sky. I mean, this is the stuff that we did. It was so innocent. And then to hear that you know, no, some guy brought her home and he didn't bring her home. So where's Tina? Now, I guess right away they started looking. She probably called the police. Tina was found relatively quickly. I'm pretty sure it was on Route 13. Route 13. It was, it was in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, but it was like right on the border of where Philly meets Bucks County. And she was found... I think by somebody walking, it was, that's as clear as I could get. I, somebody had found her. She was laying in the middle of the street and, you know, dead. Um, now, Albert Altamore, when he went to, when he was arrested, he said, oh, we didn't mean to kill her, didn't know what to do with her, all things. In one paper, he said she had to die because the car broke down and I had nothing to do with her, so she had to die. That That's what he claimed. And then, but when he was in court, I remember him saying he didn't mean to kill her. He just pushed her out of the car, and she fell and hit her head. How Albert was caught, and so quickly, was the car did break down that had run out of gas. Now, this guy came. I guess he called a guy. I don't know quite how. You know, there was pay phones back then. So he called somebody, like a triple A or something, and he said, I need gas. And the guy brought five gallons of gas with him. Now, he gave the guy $30 for five gallons of gas. In 1986, gas was 90 cents a gallon. I remember because I, I would get my license soon and... That's how much I paid for gas. To pay $30 for five gallons of gas, that's right off the bat. It was suspicious, I'm sure. And he told the guy, you didn't see me. The guy didn't think much of it because he had gotten $30. He was probably like, woohoo. But then he read about Tina being murdered. And he immediately called the police and told them about the guy who had paid $30 for the five gallons of gas. So that's how they caught Albert Altamari because of, they put everything together. It, Tina's body was found close to where the car had been. He was the one, you know, driving the car. And also, I guess, with the wife saying what she had said. And then um, I think when they arrested him, he pretty much confessed. But he they, he was caught immediately. Like, within three days like prisoners wrote to Tony and they said you know we're gonna we're gonna F him up and I'm sure that was a little soulless to her but I hope they did I know he's still in jail I did check that 
It's very hard to find information about him, though. And then there's a lot of Albert Altamari's out there, so it's, you know, you have to be particular that it's Tina Severin's. And that's how he was caught. And it was just, you know, the court thing, everything was just horrible. I, I, I'm pretty sure this this wasn't a rumor because a lot of rumors were going around then. And again, this is all memory because there's not a lot written. There's a couple articles here and there. Albert Altamari, uh, that was, of course, everyone hated him and the dad. You know, Tina's dad had come in, and he was going to kill him. He had brought a gun in. Fortunately, he didn't act out on it. And it's just terrible. I mean, it, it that family, what it went, what they went through, I mean, it caused tremendous grief between the husband and wife. And I remember my mom, Tony, Tina's mother, taking long walks because my mom was going through a divorce with my father and this had happened so they that's how you know they just took long walks together it was sad and, and that Christmas the older sister had spent like three thousand dollars trying to you know make a good Christmas for the family because of what happened or whatever good Christmas they could have and then somebody broke into the car and stole all the presents so it was like one knock after the next I always think back to Tina and I always you know when I look at her the twins daughter I see Tina in her and when I think back to Tina it just makes me crazy because I the story isn't like you know the stories that you see on TV that were so convoluted and it took 20 years to find them. So I, I, I had often tried to get Tina's story told. The mom had once told me, you know, can you maybe keep Tina's name out there or get it out there? And I, I always wanted to do that for her. But unfortunately, for TV purposes, the story is, it's it's like um, not a huge twist and turn story it it happened and he was caught right away but to us it was just so huge because it it changed the way we did things I mean then parents were like you know we, they wanted us home one time and I remember my sister was late one night and my dad almost oh my gosh my mom had to protect my sister because I thought my dad was going to kill her I mean he was furious you know people were scared it did change a lot of things that was for Tina Severins and and I in telling the story you know it keeps her name alive it keeps her immortal because she was a good girl and she was a beautiful person and that should have never have happened that was a brief podcast but it was necessary because I always wanted to talk about Tina Severance. Again, this is The Strange and Unusual, The Right Shoe. Uh, the podcast is named because for some reason when somebody gets murdered and if they lose a shoe, it seems to always be the right shoe. Not all the time, but 90% of the time. That is why I named my podcast the right show um it was for the first one which was matthew larson he had lost his right shoe and they never found it and also it goes back to the old unsolved mysteries where the right shoe of eugene cabet and kurt sova their right shoe was missing so there's a few famous cases with that bizarre little caveat i want to do the frankfurt slasher next which it happened in Philadelphia. It happened at a time when I was down there taking the bus, and it was apparently there was a bar named Gold Goldies. I, I I mean I lived here my whole life, and I don't remember this bar, but it seems that anybody that went in there, all these women from that bar were killed by this Frankfurt slasher. But they arrested a black man, and 
I, he's still on Wikipedia as the killer, and I don't think he was the killer. Also, when he was in jail, the Frankfurt Slasher killed someone else, and they had even arrested a girl for it at one point. So it's an interesting story that will be next. And again, this podcast was for Tina Severins. God bless you, Tina. Your spirit is everywhere, and you are deeply missed, and we love you. This is Debbie Q with The Right Shoe.